This week on Jersey Matters, as we head into Thanksgiving and the holiday season, should we expect another spike in COVID cases? We asked Dr. Brian Strom, Vice President of Health Affairs at Rutgers University. The hiring crisis hits New Jersey nursing homes. They have open beds, but not enough workers. We'll ask AAA how high gas prices are going to go and if less people are traveling this year. And you'll meet the 12 year old New Jersey boy who is the youngest chess grandmaster in history. Welcome to Jersey Matters, I'm Larry Menti. Thanksgiving was ruined for a lot of families last year, but this year is different and family gatherings are back. But Dr. Brian Strom, Vice Chancellor of Biomedical and Health Sciences at Rutgers University says that will cause another spike in cases. Doctor, thanks so much again uh, for talking with us. I, I, we thought of you because the last time I talked to you, you predicted a spike after a holiday. I think it might've been the 4th of July. Are we expecting another spike now with Thanksgiving and the holidays coming up? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, and in fact, you know, after thanks, after Halloween, um, and then it'll be more so after Thanksgiving, but after Halloween, um, the downward slope of the pandemic has now in the U.S. has stopped and it's beginning to turn upward again. And even in New Jersey, it's very slowly beginning to turn upward again. So certainly after Thanksgiving with everybody getting together with, with public health measures being relaxed, we certainly will see another surge. And again, after Christmas uh, and so on, but it will never be as because particularly in New Jersey, because we have done so much better in vaccination um, and much better than much of the rest of the country as well. It'll never be as bad as it was in the past. Um, you know, we're moving to the stage where this pandemic is going to become an endemic uh, instead of pandemic. So, so it'll be much more like the flu, at least for vaccinated people. Um, you know, flu always um, made people sick, killed um, some people, it was 25 to hundred uh, to 50,000 people a year in the U.S. Uh, we tolerate that with flu shots, uh, only being uh, being about 50% effective, um, and, and yet varies from year to year, and yet only about 50% of people got flu shots. We have much more effective shots um, um, now for, for COVID. Um, if you, for those people who are vaccinated and more, more recently boosted as, as needed, their risk of getting uh, COVID is decreased. It's not zero. It is not 100% protective anymore, not with Delta variant. Um, their risk is definitely um, less. Their risk of transmitting it to others is less. Again, not zero. So, but, but the risk of getting very sick from it, hospitalized and dying, is dramatically less. So the key difference is, is with flu, uh, you know, the, the death rate from COVID was about 20 times higher than flu. That's not true if you're fully vaccinated. And so, so it, it, we're moving to a state where we will learn to tolerate this and live with this. Part of that is flu happens every winter. This is going to happen every winter. We'll move, we've moved indoors. Uh, we'll be indoors more. We get together for holidays. Um, and, and like flu, which, which is a beginning now, the COVID winter COVID surge is, is beginning now. But again, I, I, I don't want to leave people the wrong impression. It will not be anywhere close to as bad as it was in prior years. Well, that's great news, but I, I guess people should still take some precautions going into the holidays. What can they do? Uh, first advice, piece of advice is get vaccinated. Second piece of advice is get vaccinated. Third piece of advice is get vaccinated. Um, the best thing you can do is be vaccinated. If you're in a group of people who are vaccinated, um, again, always better to be outdoors, always better to be distanced, always be better to be masked. But, but being with in person, vaccinated people nowadays is really um, reasonably safe. You're talking about risks from the flu or less. So getting together with family uh, for holidays, I'm certainly doing that. Uh, other people can do that as long as everybody's vaccinated. It's it's much much safer than it than, than it was. You know, there's risk with each person. The larger the number of people, uh, the better. But the typical family gathering, five people, ten people, twenty people. If everybody's vaccinated, shouldn't be a problem. Um, and it just recognize if you then get sick afterwards, get tested for the COVID. It might be you want to be careful about giving it to other people, but your likelihood of ending up in the hospital or dying from it is very, very small if you're vaccinated. Unvaccinated, different story. 
stay distanced, stay home, um, uh, or if you're or if you're immunosuppressed. But but for the normal person, uh, this should be much much closer to a normal holiday. You hear a lot of reasons for not getting the vaccination from people who are unvaccinated. And the one that seems to have at least a little bit of credibility is the fact that they've had COVID and that they feel like they have the antibodies and they have some immunity. Is that true? Um, it's certainly true that people feel that way. It's certainly true that people have had COVID have some antibodies, um, but it's been well shown now that the vaccine gives better protection and longer lasting protection. And even people who've had COVID should get the COVID vaccine because it will um, broaden their protection to other variants and, it, and the protection lasts longer than it does after native COVID. I wanted to change topics a little bit and talk about the booster shot. Should everybody be getting it? Certainly adults should be getting it. Uh, we'll see recommendations this week from FDA and, and CDC recommending it more broadly. Um, it's already been recommended, um, again, for people who haven't had it more than six months since their prior dose. Um, or people who had J&J first, um, who are over age 65 or otherwise high risk. This week, we'll see recommendations that are approved uh, going forward, almost surely broadening it to all adults. A number of states have already made that change, uh, even not waiting for CDC and FDA. There's a lot of people who are concerned about getting their children vaccinated, even with the first vaccine. Are they legitimate concerns? I think the vac these vaccines are extraordinarily safe. Then, um, and the best way to protect our children is to vaccinate them. So rather than them going to school, going uh, and getting exposed to other people uh, who they can get the disease from, it's much safer to get the vaccine than to get the disease. But the best way to protect your children as well as to protect everybody around your children um, is, is to get them vaccinated. Pfizer now has a pill that minimizes symptoms. What's, what's, your, uh, what's your feelings about that? The Pfizer pill is very exciting development as far as we can tell. Again, we haven't, no, people haven't seen the science. This is by press release. Um, it hasn't been reviewed by FDA. It hasn't been approved by FDA. People haven't seen the science yet. But this will be the first treatment, and there will certainly, hopefully, be others um, that you can give outpatient to, to people uh, once they get symptoms to, to uh, prevent the symptoms from getting much worse. So it's analogous to Tamiflu with, with flu. Um, um, the, it, it's a major helpful development if in fact it's real, but the best treat, the best, um, approach still is to get vaccinated. Well, doctor, you're always a wealth of information. We really appreciate your time. Have a, have a great holiday. Have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you. You too. Dr. Brian Strom, Rutgers university. Still to come on Jersey matters, nursing homes in New Jersey are still having problems, but it's not what you might think. We'll explain next. Welcome back to Jersey Matters. The pandemic wreaked havoc on New Jersey nursing homes, but now they have a new problem. They don't have enough workers. Here's my interview with Andy Aronson, CEO of the Healthcare Association of New Jersey. Thank you, sir, for joining us again. The last time we spoke, you were unquestionably down because things were dismal. I think that's the right word at nursing homes and long care facilities. Have things gotten better? Yeah, Larry, unquestionably things are better than they were in our facilities. The, the use of the vaccines, uh, over 90% of our residents in our facilities are vaccinated. Over 80% of the staff in our facilities are vaccinated. The vaccines have proven to be very effective in keeping the rates of infection low in our facilities and certainly preventing uh, the serious illness and the hospitalization and the death of our residents. Uh, so that's been good news. And our facilities just continue to get better at dealing with COVID. So unquestionably, our residents are doing better. I think the last time we spoke, though, we were talking about the the finances and the fact that some long care facilities were struggling and many had a difficulty finding workers. Is, is that improved? So it's still a huge problem. Um, obviously COVID has had a big impact on the finances of our facilities. Our um, census rates in our facilities have, are going back up a little more slowly than we would like, obviously, but they are ticking back up. 
Uh, finding workers has proven to be a very big challenge. Uh, we lost a lot of workers during this pandemic. Long-term care was hit harder than any other sector of the healthcare market. Um, and we continue that to be a challenge with the new vaccine mandates that just came out from the federal government. Um, we will lose some workers in our facilities and at a time where we have a shortage to begin with that, that will cause a problem for us. Yeah, I saw a report that was out that said nursing homes were down 221,000 jobs since the start of the pandemic. You're nodding your head in agreement. Yes. Well, part of that is the, the loss in census in our facilities. So obviously when census goes down, there are less residents and less workers. But uh, too big a part of that number is the fact that we just can't find workers to work in the facilities. Uh, remember, long-term care is financed primarily through Medicare and Medicaid. That's how most of our residents are paid. We do not have the ability to just raise our rates uh, or charge more and, and pay workers more. So uh, what's basically happened is uh, we have to pay our workers more to work in our facilities. The, the rates of pay have gone up tremendously since the beginning of this pandemic uh, in order to attract those workers. And because of uh, just the way the market is, it's very, very hard to attract those workers. Have nursing homes and long care term facilities, have they, have they had to close? Have you had some that have just closed up shop? So we haven't had uh, many closures in New Jersey. I think you've seen some closures across the country. Um, you know, as this goes on, I think you're likely to see some facilities closed, but I don't think that's going to be a big problem in New Jersey. I think what you're seeing more than a facility closure is you're just seeing facilities operating at a lower census level than they used to. They can't bring in more residents because they don't have the staffing to take care of the residents. And I think that's the bigger impact on facilities right now. Have you seen that problem already? I mean, have there been people that have been turned away? Yeah, that's happening all throughout our state. Um, it, it's created a problem for the facilities, obviously, because you can't fill up, you can't operate an appropriate census. Uh, it also creates a problem, obviously, for people that need the care, because uh, eventually that will create an access problem for people. Oh, that's a, that's a, if it continues to grow, that's a serious health care problem, uh, yes. especially for the elderly in the, in the state. Uh, who do you look to for help with that? Well, we obviously have to look to funding sources. We have to look to government. We have to look to the state for Medicaid uh, funding, and we have to look to the federal government for Medicare funding and relief. Uh, we need to be given the ability to pay our workers more. And as we have the ability to pay our workers more to compete for nurses, for example, with hospital systems that get to pay the nurses a little bit more than nursing homes do, uh, we need to be able to compete for those workers uh, in order to, to fully staff the facilities and then provide, obviously, enough beds for the people that need them. It's, it's almost, and excuse me for if, if, if I'm not being articulate with this, but it's almost a nice problem to have because... I was thinking that you might have a problem of getting people to come to your facilities because of the negative publicity, much of it, no fault of your own. You were forced to, to take some people, but you might have a, a trouble of getting customers that people would be staying home. That doesn't seem to be happening. It's hard to say that might be happening in some places. The nursing home industry did get a lot of negative publicity um, during the pandemic. I think people have, learned over time and understood that nursing homes actually did an exceptional job taking care of people during this pandemic. And people in nursing homes right now are safer than people are in the general community. So I think that has largely um, not gone away. That's the wrong way to say it, but it's been reduced and people are willing to come into nursing homes now. Like I said, I think the biggest problem in, in raising our census is the staffing shortage at this point. That, that really is where we have to focus our efforts. You have beds that are unfilled right now. And Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. The occupancy rate in nursing homes in, in New Jersey is somewhere in the low 70s, about 72 percent. OK, well, I, I, I hope for better days for you. And I've been saying this every time we speak because you are an important part of the health care system. And uh, if this and let, well, I'll ask you instead of trying to speculate on my own, if this continues, what happens? I don't expect it to continue indefinitely. Let's put it that way. I, I think what's going to happen is I think that uh, policymakers in our state um, are aware of the problems. I think they're committed to working with us to fix the problems. 
And as you said, nursing homes are an essential piece of the healthcare continuum in New Jersey. We need these facilities in order to care for people who need this care. So ultimately, I think we're going to find solutions to the problem. All right, then we'll talk again. Uh, Fantastic. I'd love to talk to you with better news. Thank you, sir. Appreciate, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Larry. Andy Aronson, CEO of the New Jersey Healthcare Association. Still to come on Jersey Matters. Global supply chain shortages continue to affect industries across the country. And here in New Jersey, a local soup kitchen is feeling the strain. More on that story next. Supply chain shortages continue to affect industries all across the country and here in New Jersey. And here in New Jersey, a soup kitchen that's been helping thousands of people for over 30 years is also seeing the effects. Our Jennifer Marin has their story. Jennifer. Larry, New Rochelle and Jay helped feed the Morris County community seven days a week. And they tell me demand continues to rise, but so, do the prices. Unloading trucks of food, setting up. This is one of our free farmers markets. We do five markets per week for residents of Morristown and Dover. And then helping feed a community in need. I'm gonna leave a bag for, for you and her. That's a promise Nora Shenje has been fulfilling in Morris County for over 30 years. We cater to seniors. Uh, we cater obviously to families. We do in Dover at, at one of the middle schools. So we, we're trying to get the kind of spectrum of people that might need, need our help. But their commitment is being met with a challenge as global supply chain shortages are making it difficult to find certain products. Supply is a problem and it traces all the way back to the processing plants. They are having, you know, at first they had COVID outbreaks. Uh, now you have uh, difficulty hiring people. So some processing plant in North Carolina is affecting the fact that I can't get my, uh, you know, chicken tenders from our, our food distributors in New Jersey. And if they do find these items, the prices are sky high. You know, for us, even the items we can get are at that higher price that we're talking about. Uh, and, and staples, not even luxury items. We're talking about milk and eggs. Uh, the gloves that we use in the kitchen have gone uh, doubled in price from about $38, $40 a case to nearly $80 now. This at a time when demand at the soup kitchen has hit an all-time high. We see new faces. We see faces that maybe didn't need our help two years ago, three years ago. And as prices go up, Bind tells me donations have gone down from everyday people and corporate donors. So it's 18 months now that people have to reconsider what their giving is and what they're able to give. Some people have recovered and have, have continued to support us as an organization. Uh, others are coming along slower, so we're not seeing the same numbers and we are having to get more creative with our fundraising. We understand people are facing their own choices that they have to make and we're grateful for every dollar that comes in. But Nora Shenje isn't just helping fight food insecurity. After we um, connect, they start asking for employment, they ask, uh, start asking for um, mental health um, assistance, they ask for, um, for housing, even for legal services. So yeah, a little bit of everything. According to a report by the Associated Press, a surge in U.S. household spending that continues to outpace supply has resulted in the current issues. Experts predict shortages could last until late 2022 or 2023. If you're interested in helping Norris NJ, you can visit our website. That's jerseymatters.com. For now, reporting in Morristown for Jersey Matters, I'm Jennifer Marin. Thank you, Jen. Next on Jersey Matters. I'm Phil Andrews, and coming up on Jersey Matters, we'll tell you how the Trenton area soup kitchen is getting ready for Thanksgiving. For the first time in 30 years, New Jersey will grace a U.S. Navy vessel and patrol the oceans in the name of peace and liberty. This week, Governor Phil Murphy and First Lady Tammy Murphy were there to witness the christening of the third USS New Jersey submarine. 
Welcome back to Jersey Matters. I'm Larry Menti. The Trenton area soup kitchen has been catering to the underserved in Mercer County for decades. And as Phil Andrews now explains, not even a once in a lifetime pandemic can deter them from serving up Thanksgiving dinners this year. Phil. Well, last year, COVID-19 protocol forced the folks here at the Trenton Area Soup Kitchen to shut down their dining hall and feed folks outside. But this year, well, things are a little different. As a matter of fact, Task started reopening its doors to inside meals about four months ago. I guess July is when we started opening inside up to a limited number of people and um, allows people to come sit down. Then it was to get out of the heat. Now it's to get out of the cold and, and or rain and have a comfortable place to eat and have a little a little community, you know, talk to other people and not just be, you know, to yourself, have to sit by yourself and eat. It's we had um, about 98% of our staff vaccinated and it got very, very hot at the beginning of July. And we just looked at everything. We talked about how we would do this and um, it's been really, really good. Um, most everybody masks up, you know, unless they're eating and we limited the number of people in the dining room, spacing them out a little bit more. Now, the soup kitchen is open five days a week and they prepare about 10,000 meals each week. And much of the food they serve comes largely through donations. But like everything else these days, they too have had to deal with supply chain demands. It, it affects us in a few different ways. You know, we, we don't have the variety of products we, we like to use and the timing of getting product is taking a little longer, but being a soup kitchen, we work off of what's available. So, you know, our availability of stuff has changed and we're, we're just working with what, what we have. You know, we still have a lot of chicken available, you know, beef, some fish is available. So we just have to do more chicken than we would have in the past, but we, we make it work. Now, as I said earlier, patrons were not allowed inside the building for their Thanksgiving meal last year. But that did not stop them from waiting in line outside to grab a meal to go. So being able to open the doors this year means an awful lot to the folks that work here at TASK. Thanksgiving is probably the most special day that we have during the year. And to not have had people to be able to come in and sit down and have some volunteers, have a couple special things, we we'll still get packaged meals, but we'll have volunteers going around with fruit and coffee and soup. Um, it just is more of a Thanksgiving feel. So I'm really happy that we're able to do that this year. We're still going to put out the same quality Thanksgiving meal we've done in the past. It's just going to be uh, a little bit smaller scale. We won't have as many volunteers in the building, but we're going to try and feed everybody that, that wants to come down and have a, a fresh cooked Thanksgiving meal. Is there a limit? I know you can only let so many people in at a time, but is there a limit to how long they're allowed to stay in here? Right. We have not established a limit uh, yet as to how long someone can stay in. Uh, we are limited to the seats. We still have a lot of people take their meals out. Uh, on occasion, we'll notice that, you know, someone's been sitting for a long time. We suggest that they normally would leave, but it has not been an issue to this point. Um, most of those, then, if people stay, they want to sit and talk with someone. They just have to be masked up and and basically socially distant, and they're allowed to to sit. Oh, and by the way, for those who don't want to eat inside the building, there is uh, also a tent set up outside with tables, chairs, and heaters. For Jersey Matters at the Trenton Area Soup Kitchen, I'm Phil Andrews, and folks, have a happy Thanksgiving. Welcome back to Jersey Matters. I'm Larry Menti. We were curious about how the pandemic might affect Thanksgiving travel this year. So we went to the man with all of the travel answers, Robert Sinclair, Senior Manager of Public Affairs at AAA. Thanks so much for doing this. As always, I imagine you're getting a lot of calls right now because we're headed into one of the biggest travel times in the country every single year, except I guess during the pandemic. Is travel back? 
Travel is nearly back. We're at 5% of pre-pandemic levels, 5% of what we saw in 2019. And in the tri-state area, back in 2019, we were seeing the worst congestion in the history of the city of New York. So to be back at nearly that level is uh, very busy indeed. And we're still seeing a lot of people shunning public transportation with ridership down on New Jersey Transit and Long Island Railroad and Metro North. And they're not riding the trains. What are they doing? They're driving their cars. And so the roads are particularly busy right now. Well, it's interesting because the traffic's going to be a real barometer as to where we are right now, because a lot of people are still a little wary of having big family gatherings or big Thanksgiving or Christmas gatherings. But you've seen this uptick. Will we be back to where we've been in the past? According to our projections, we're going to be nearly there. But you're right, this recent uptick that we're seeing globally, uh, Germany and Eastern Europe and certain uh, cities and states around the country might put a damper on things. And I think that uh, if there's any positive coming out of it, uh, you know, the Saudis were very prescient in that they did not want to increase oil production because they feared a resurgence of COVID and the lessening of demand. And that seems to be coming true. Um, and so we're still seeing gasoline prices that are the highest since 2014. But those who want to travel will not be deterred by high gasoline prices, traffic, or crowded airports or anything else. There is a lot of pent up demand, a wanderlust for people to get out there and travel. You know, AAA is one of the largest leisure travel agencies in our bookings are 40, 50 percent above where they have been uh, for the rest of this year and on into next year um, for domestic and international travel. So this it's going to be busy, we think, as uh, especially the day before Thanksgiving with commuters mixing with those holiday travelers. I would anticipate just uh, crowded roads, crowded skies, crowded every means of transportation for this holiday. Do you know, do you have the information on where people are going? Are they avoiding crowded areas? They're going to the Caribbean. They're going to Orlando. They're going to Las Vegas, Anaheim, Hawaii. Um, and, wow. and the international travelers, they want to take a river cruise somewhere in Europe, and particularly in Germany. So uh, that's, that's really, uh, it, it's... They're really getting out there. And, and no, I, it's under it, what you're saying is it's the same travel as always. It, it really hasn't changed. It, you, you're, you keep hearing people want to go to bed and breakfast. They want to be isolated. They want to just be with their family. Orlando's Disney World. You know, exactly. the, 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 uh, the river cruises are Viking cruises down, the, down exactly. in Germany. And so they're, not, they're with people. They're crowded. They're the same travel as always. It, in a way, it's a good sign because it means things are getting back to normal, but it does mean that people are going to be around other people and there's crowds again and, and we're spiking. The one thing that I don't have the sheer numbers on is cruising. Um, people are definitely going to you know, Jamaica, Dominican Republic, Aruba, Cancun, those kind of places, uh, taking a cruise. Don't have the sheer numbers though. And we know that during the middle of the summer, there was a, a, a test cruise and something like 25 people came back COVID positive. Uh, so there is still that perhaps hesitancy or, or let's say lack of available space as far as cruising is concerned. Um, that other category, which is trains, buses and cruises um, is much higher than last year. Um, um, more than a million compared to about 230,000 last year. But uh, cruising is still that kind of X factor that's, that's lagging behind. It will be interesting to see what happens with the surge and if that affects cruising, will there be more or less uh, coming out of more ports or fewer ports? Uh, we'll have to see. I'm going to ask you an impossible question, uh, one that's easy to answer for three A's, one that I think is a little bit more difficult, and that is where are gas prices now? That's the easy one. Where are they going? Ooh. Well, let's see. 363 in the city of New York. All right. New Jersey is at 345. Um, New Jersey is about the same as a week ago. What's really distressing about these prices is that these are the peak prices of the year. This time of year, we're accustomed to seeing prices go down. You know, there's the normal cycle, the rise and fall of gasoline prices. They peak sometime in May, June, July, 
sometimes as late as August. Then they start trending downward as demand goes down at the end of the summer driving season after Labor Day. That's not the case this year. Prices are the highest of the of the year. Back in 2020, when gasoline was $1.20, $1.25 cheaper, we peaked in May. But we're at the peak now. Where we go remains to be seen. It's really based on a global commodity, a globally traded and priced commodity, crude oil. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Saudis decided not to increase production uh, beyond those levels of 480,000 barrel per day increase that they did a couple months ago. Uh, but last year, they cut it by uh, nearly 2 million barrels per day. And as go the Saudis, so goes OPEC, OPEC plus. And uh, with this, um, I won't say lack of crude oil, but limited supply of crude oil, it looks like gasoline prices are going to stay the same. Uh, crude oil did drop a little bit last week. They were upwards of $84 a barrel, and then we were down to $80 a barrel at the beginning this week. And I think that was a result of the Biden administration signaling that it might release oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Oil and gasoline market is extremely fickle. It's something real or imagined can lead to price swings of major proportions. You know, some terrorist group says it's going to mine the Straits of Hormuz or, or do something and then price goes up and then uh, something happens and it goes back down. And really, there were no real consequences. Nothing really happened. So it's, it's really a fickle market and drivers are, are subject to this fickle market and at the mercy of this fickle market and suffering as a result. See, I said it was a difficult question. It wasn't for you. You're the best. Thank you so much. Enjoy your holidays. Thank you very much. You do the same. Please be safe. Don't drink and drive. Make sure the vehicle's in good shape before you hit the road. We're anticipating 400,000 breakdowns among AAA members for the, for the five-day holiday. Flat tires, dead batteries. Get them checked before you hit the road. Information even in the goodbye. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Robert Sinclair, Senior Manager, Public Affairs, AAA. Still to come, the youngest chess grandmaster in history is from New Jersey. You'll meet him next. At a major international chess tournament in Budapest, Hungary, a 12-year-old from Englishtown, New Jersey, became the youngest grandmaster in history. Meet newly crowned grandmaster Abi Mishra from Englishtown. Let me start off, uh, young man. Thank you so much for joining us by saying congratulations. How do you become a grandmaster? Thank you. And the requirements to become a grandmaster, it's it's like you need to play in a certain a certain type of tournament, and there like there it's like a very long tournament, like nine like nine game a nine game tournament, and you need to play against certain people from different countries, and you need to play against you need to play against like three grandmasters or something, and you need to get a certain number of points in that to get the norm, and you need these you need three of these kind of norms to become a grandmaster, and you need a rating of twenty five hundred per day, which is international rating. How, how many grandmasters are there in the world? In the world, they're around roughly, I guess, a thousand. A and thousand. yeah, it feels great to be the youngest. You are the youngest. Uh, yes. Are you the youngest ever? Yeah. You're the youngest grandmaster in chess ever. In the, in the world history. And how long have you been playing? I've been, uh, I've been playing competitive tournaments since I was five, but I, I started learning how to play chess when I was two and a half. Uh, how, did, how did they know that you were so good at it? Did it? Was it right away? Were you just a prodigy as soon as you saw the board? My father, he taught me the game when I was two and a half, and it was very fun. It, was, it seemed like a very interesting game for me, and I just decided to keep going on with it. And, and this term prodigy, I mean, for me, I believe that like, I didn't have so much talent as such, and it's uh, all my results are basically... Like uh, all the efforts I've, all the hours I've put in over the years, this is, this is a result of that. 
Right. That, that, I've heard this a, a million times. Every great overnight success had to work for 10,000 hours to get to that point, that there yeah. is really no such thing, that you have to put the work in. But you must love it. Yeah, it's a very fun game with multiple possibilities, like many, many, many possibilities. So, yeah. And what, wh- how are people reacting to this? Do, you, you, do your friends know? Yeah, my friends know. They're all very happy. They're all congratu- they were all congratulating me. So what happens now? Yeah, so from here, my next goal is to become a Super Grand Master, which is like 2,700 uh, international rating. And it's like approximately top 30 in the world. And I'm trying to get this by, by 15. And my final goal is, is to become world champion. And what, since you had an age specific for the, uh, for the next level, when do you want to become world champion? By what age? World champion as soon as possible. We'll see. Is, is there a, who was the youngest world champion ever? Yeah. The youngest world champion, I, I think it's Magnus Carlsen at the age of 22. At 22. So you have a long, you're going to, you're going to probably break that, right? I'll the try. Way you're going with your trajectory right now. Th- that may be you. How many moves can you see ahead? When you see a board, how many moves do you believe you can see ahead? Of course, it depends on the position as such, because some positions you cannot, they're not the type of position where you, where you would calculate that much and you just make an, a natural move. But yeah, some positions which are very like concrete and tactical, I guess you could say I can calculate like 15, 20 moves ahead 15. In, certain, in certain positions, of course. Uh, th- that to me is incredible. How do you do in school? Yeah, my school is also going great. And the thing is, chess in school, it's chess is very close to life. And of course, school is basically life. And yeah, chess basically also helps with school as in school, I'm able to solve uh, analytical problems much faster than before because of chess. And you believe chess is part of that? Yeah. Because, it, because it's an interesting question of what came first. I mean, is the analytical part in you so that you can solve other problems just like chess, or did chess teach you that? I guess you'll never know because you started playing when you're two and a half years old. Yeah, but I feel like chess has some kind of impact on that because most of chess is an analytical, so of course. Well, it's wonderful what happens. It's wonderful that you're from New Jersey. It's going to be amazing to see where you go. Are you ready for this? Because... You know, in the past, people that become the world champions or the national champions are celebrities. You ready for all of that? Sure. Yes. I think that's the perfect answer. Sure. Yeah, right. Whatever. (laughs) I'm going to be the world champion. Whatever. (laughs) I'll be fine. I mean, of course, like it's it's of course, it's a very long road from here. Like it's not like. Of course, the trajectory is, is going very, it's going up a lot. But the thing is, like, as the higher, like, the higher the level becomes, of course, it's more difficult to, to get past it. But, yeah, I'm hoping to become world champion. I get it. I'm assuming a lot is what you're saying. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you're going to go right from here to world champion. What you're reminding me is that's not a given. It's a goal. It's not a given. You have a lot more work to do. And we'd love to talk to you again if that's okay. Uh, as you progress. Thank you so much for your time. Abhi Mishra, the 12-year-old chess grandmaster from New Jersey. Next on Jersey Matters. What would it take for you to quit the habit of smoking? One New Jersey woman tells us it was for a reason that you may not expect. We'll have that story coming up next on Jersey Matters. Welcome back. November is Lung Cancer Awareness Month. Smoking is the number one cause of lung cancer. And smoking is so addictive, it's difficult to quit. But Jersey Matters' Kimberly Kravitz introduces us now to a New Jersey woman who kicked the habit and changed her life. Kimberly. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death worldwide, and a huge contributor of that problem is smoking. We spoke with one New Jersey woman who decided to kick the habit altogether before it was too late. I mean, you know, this is an investment into your health. 
53-year-old Natasha Wyatt Johnson of Whiting, New Jersey, took her final cigarette this past October, but it wasn't to save herself from a lung cancer diagnosis. I was having weight loss surgery. I was a good candidate for it, and that was one of the requirements, quit smoking. Dr. Thomas Bauer, chairman of surgery at Jersey Shore University Medical Center, says that your appointment would be canceled if nicotine was detected before any surgery. Any list of surgeries that you can come up with, the risks of complications are much less if you stop smoking, uh, ideally a month uh, before surgery, but, you know, at least two weeks. Natasha, a smoker for over 40 years, has tried to kick the habit before, but this time she thinks it will stick. There are plenty of times when uh, I could be a pack a day smoker, a half a pack a smoker, or just, uh, you know, go around to the Chinese store and get some Lucy's. Now that um, I'm done with the surgery, I just, I don't, I don't have any desire for it at all. And it certainly has been easier on her pocketbook. You know, I have like new co-pays I didn't have before that I've got to deal with. And so if I was smoking, I'd probably be wondering where I'd get the money from, but I'm kind of just like letting that go to that. You know what I mean? The air in the house, absolutely fresher. But she couldn't have done it without the help of Scott Carroll, a tobacco treatment specialist who held her hand through the entire process. A lot of it is because a lot of people have tried to quit, sometimes millions of times, you know, and, 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 and the really big challenge with, with nicotine is that nicotine is one of the hardest ones to quit. Like it's harder than alcohol, it's harder than cocaine, it's harder than heroin and opiates. So just think, if it were easier to quit smoking, how many people would not be battling against cancer? About 90% of all lung cancer is caused uh, by smoking. Uh, that obviously doesn't guarantee that if you smoke, you will get lung cancer. Like, you know, so they're getting rid of 7,000 toxins going into their system every time they let a cigarette. Smoking also, besides lung cancer, causes many other cancers, kidney cancer, pancreatic, uh, a number of cancers are at a much higher incidence than those that smoke. Thankfully, in Natasha's case, she chose to make this decision, and she didn't have to due to a diagnosis. You know, because it's a voluntary surgery, an elective surgery, you know, I want to give my body the best opportunity possible to heal without having any type of roadblocks and, you know, you're going to have your normal hurdles anyway, so why add that? You know, health experts suggest that if you were unable to quit smoking, they recommend a screening as that can save an estimated 24,000 lives each year. Reporting from Lakewood for Jersey Matters, I'm Kimberly Kravitz. All right, thanks, Kimberly. My commentary is next. There is so much misinformation and outright lies circulating the internet about the COVID-19 vaccine that I want to take a couple of minutes to separate fact from fake so that you can make the most informed decision. Let's begin with a Canadian website, Canadian alleged news website called the Conservative Beaver. Their exclusive is that the wife of the CEO of Pfizer was rushed to New York Presbyterian Hospital and died. Cause of death, according to the Canadian website, complications from receiving the COVID-19 vaccine. Well, that news came as a complete surprise to Miriam Borla, the wife of Pfizer's CEO, Albert Borla. That's her on the end there, attending a leadership awards ceremony in Manhattan on November 11th. And man, does she look great, considering it was reported she died on November 10th, the day before. Pfizer had to release a statement saying that Miriam is alive and well. Now, normally this story wouldn't even be worth talking about. I mean, come on, the conservative beaver isn't exactly the New York Times, or even the Podunk Weekly Shopper. But that story was shared on social media thousands of times, and when you read the comments, you see 
people wanted to believe it. As Mark Twain once said, a lie can make it halfway around the world before the truth can even put its shoes on. Which brings us to Fox News host Tucker Carlson, who recently claimed that people are dying every single day from the COVID-19 vaccine. Between late December of 2020 and last month, a total of 3,362 people apparently died after getting the COVID vaccine in the United States. 3,362. That's an average of roughly 30 people every day. That was a textbook example of dangerously pandering to an audience by omission of facts. Tucker Carlson did get his information from VAERS, the Vaccine Adverse Effects reporting site run by the CDC and the FDA, and he ran with it without giving it any context. You see, any death after getting the vaccine can be reported to VAERS, but then it has to be investigated by medical examiners to find out if there was a direct correlation or if the people just died from other causes after getting the vaccine. After the investigation, it turns out that the deaths of three women back in April were caused by the COVID-19 vaccine because it brought on a rare blood clotting condition. The CDC then paused the use of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine until it could issue guidance. And since then, tens of millions of people have received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and it's caused no deaths. The Tucker Carlson video was shared thousands of times on social media. It's still being shared. This misinformation is statistically more dangerous than the COVID-19 vaccine. That brings us to a Facebook meme that has been shared 75,000 times on social media. The meme asks, since the vaccine doesn't stop you from getting or spreading COVID, how are you protecting others? But you see, the vaccines have been given to a billion people worldwide, so we have some pretty good data on infections and spread. There was never a claim by scientists that the vaccines would be 100% effective, but they did promise protection of between 90 and 95%, and so far, that has played out to be true. So yes, for the vast majority of people, the vaccine does prevent them from getting or spreading COVID, and the vaccinated are far less likely to be hospitalized or die. So when you get vaccinated, you're protecting others, but most importantly, you're protecting yourself. And that's why the USA fact checker rated this meme as false. But here is one that's true. With the holidays fast approaching with big family gatherings and celebrations, there will inevitably be another spike in COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations and deaths. And the vast majority of them will be unvaccinated people. So if you really want to do something nice for your family this Thanksgiving, get vaccinated. Then everybody can have a happy and healthy Thanksgiving. I'm Larry Menti. We'll talk again next week.